up a voice to say praise the Lord I am a praise the Lord praise the Lord because because he's good and it's mine Hasn't the Lord been good to you? Hey, hey, because it's good. You, Lord, you've been good to me. And to mercy. Yeah. Come on, let everybody say.
Somebody testify this morning. I do more. 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 Hey, I do more. When you do more. Bible says we shall rejoice and be glad. I know it rained this morning, so many of you are still on their way coming, but let's give them a clap of offerings as they are coming. Amen. We will move on, just be upstanding, just take the offerings. Let's take an offering, a big offering, mighty offering to God. This is our access offering. Oh, you can sit for one second once you prepare your offerings. Amen. As we prepare our offerings unto God, today is a special day. We have a visitor with us. Once he comes, I will introduce him. And we know Bishop is also in town. He is preaching this morning. God is using him mightily. So if you have your offerings, just stand on your feet again. Say a simple prayer over your offering. You speak over your offering. Send your offering as an agenda. And to go and get whatever you desire. Offering must come with a blessing. Speak over your offering. Speak blessings over your lives. Speak blessings over your children. 
God understand and God hear your prayer. Father, we thank you for answering our prayer. Say amen.
Hallelujah. Let's be seated. I love the song. It says, Joy, when you go to heaven, but I would love, love to enjoy having joy on earth before I go to the heaven. If you don't enjoy life on earth, you will not know how to enjoy life on, in heaven. Say amen. Now, this is the first time you're going to have the dance ministry minister unto us. I hope they are ready. Mary was here training the children. If you have a child at home, like uh, the dance ministry has helped significantly in New York. So if you have a child sitting at home, please bring them. I know this church, you're very young and uh, have a long, young children. Please allow them to come and worship God in any form that they can do. If the dance ministry is ready, please, can you come forward as we give Jesus a clap offering? Let's welcome them. The novel coronavirus has taken many lives and put many into critical conditions. First coronavirus death outside of China. Chronic failures in the health system of South Africa's Eastern Cape have been exposed by the pandemic. and by prayers many have traveled this has generated a hashtag that has been trending for a while now and that is in god Son of the kingdom, my life free from sin. No, I'm coming who I'm in sorrow. Yes, who I don't need to control. I'm the son of the kingdom, living my life from sin. No, I'm coming who I'm in sorrow.
if you're here for the first time, can you just raise your hand? Let's, rec- let's welcome you. If you're here for the first time, just raise your hand. If you're, if you're here, oh, you want to stand? Okay, stand as well. If you're here, okay, let's give, it, let's give it up for them. Let's give it up for them. Let's give it up for them. Anybody here for the first time? All right, immediately after the service, Pastor Les, an evangelist who is right there, you know, shaking their hands. Everybody, once you're here for the first time, just see Evangelist Pierre Kubi. Uh, who has, I mean, uh, uh, Evangelist has been great. Let's give, him, let's give him a clap offering for the past few weeks. He's, t- he, he's teaching, he's blessing me, and I hope he's blessing you. And I know by next week he will continue on. He's in, he, he is charged to preach for six weeks. And I don't know whether he's the second week or third week, but he's still moving. Even at the end of six weeks, let's ask Bishop to give him a chance. Let's give him a clap of friend. On that note, let's welcome our internet audience. Let's give it up for them. All over the world, those on Facebook, WhatsApp. This is Living Faith Ministry. One church in two locations, in New York and in Ghana. Say amen. Now, the, the Zion Chosen has given us their, their dance to so the living voices. Are you ready? If you don't come, I'm going to sing myself. And something I cannot do is singing. So let's give it up for them, please. Let's give it up for them. Hallelujah. The Lord has been so good to us. And whilst we are alive, you always have to be grateful. Because it's all by His grace that we live today. Amen. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the Lord which made heaven.
Amen, amen, amen. We are right on time. It's exactly 10 o'clock. Living Faith Ministry, we keep time. So I know you were a little late, but we're still doing good on time. This morning, God has been good to you. And God has been good to me. Amen. He has given us life. Not everybody that went to sleep last night woke up this morning. But the Almighty God has given you the chance to be alive this morning. So you are grateful to God. This morning, without wasting your time, we have a mighty man of God among us. A man that I have known. No, no, no. Don't clap yet. You haven't, you haven't heard nothing. We are clapping. If you're going to clap, let's clap better. Let's, give him, let's, let's clap. Amen. A man that I've known him since I've known Bishop. I've known Bishop almost about 30 years. So eventually I've known him equally so. A man that I listen to him on Facebook. But he doesn't know that I listen to him. So today my secret is out. The man when he preaches make the word simple to you. The word that comes to you that you can apply in your life. Internationally known especially in America. We are one of the biggest churches in America. It's called All Nation. We are, he's popularly known in London, in Ghana here. He's a, great, he's a great man of God. I respect him dearly. He's, uh, I, I believe your nephew is Bishop. Sometimes I get confused. Bishop, hey, hey, Amen. So when Offa is here, he's in charge. Say, so once Offa is here, even though Bishop is our Bishop, because his Offa is here, today the Offa is in town. So Offa is in charge. So whatever he asks you to do, do it, because he's what? He's in charge. Offa is here, we have said, we have said, once he is the Offa, he is the man that we have to give it up to him. Is Dr. Frank Ufusu up here popular? I like the way he calls himself Pastor Frank. Pastor Frank. So let's stand with the standing ovation. Welcome, Dr. Frank Ufusu up here. He will introduce other people. So let's give it up for him. Let's give it up for him. Let's give it up for him. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Look, I have a question. Do people respond when you greet them in this church on Sunday mornings? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I was getting a bit worried because it's like, uh, just go your way. But thank you very much, Doc, for um, having me this morning. And thank you all. Um, how many of you are happy you are alive? Good. How many of you were here last Sunday? Oh, brilliant. How many of you were not here last Sunday? Same number, wow. How many of you don't remember whether you were here or not? <laughs> but we, we, bless, we bless God and we thank God for the life of Bishop Dominic Alote, a man that God has given this vision to. And uh, we are all uh, witnesses of um, what God has used him to do and God is using him to do. You know he's on an assignment somewhere down the road and Yesterday he or something he commanded me to show up, so I'm here, and uh, I came with my my only wife, my girlfriend, my my brat, my sister. You know, uh, God has been good to us. Uh, we've been married for 40 years. Uh, you are wondering, wow. Well, we we married when we were just two years old, so been doing this thing for 40 years <laughs> so for 40 years god has been good to us it's been a good journey and we bless god for everything we want to thank all the leaders the pastors in this house uh, who are holding the fort there who is the evangelist the evangelist god bless you so much i've heard so much about you and the great work you are doing amen i, I doc you realize that in today's generation evangelism is not something that we really care about but if everything that we do could be beautiful, but if it is not geared towards souls, we are just wasting our time. 
is very important evangelism is the heartbeat of christianity you know somebody asked me the other day what is evangelism and um, maybe they were looking for something very spiritual and all i said is that evangelism is one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread we are all needy we are all beggars as it were but when you find food tell other people where to find food so let's not forget that evangelism is very important you never know true joy in christianity until you have gotten somebody to the lord jesus christ because at the end of the day when we go to heaven jesus is not going to ask us about how many houses we got and how many cars we drove and how many shoes we had the most important thing that is going to give us a reward are the people you brought to him and also your service in the house of god if you believe that say amen all right how many of you are ready for god's word good you have a bible okay you have you, you have a tablet talk is getting very worrying here why are they staring at me like that look i'm a very shy man i don't like that other than that it's going to be basa 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 then your bishop is going to say so give me a better face give me a better face I want to see your face. If your heart is happy, let your face know. Good. All right. How many of you came to write notes down? Write some things down. Okay. Only three and a half people. I think the last time I came, how many of you were the last time I came for the workers' meeting? Okay. I told you that a, long, a short pen, a short pencil is better than a long memory. Make sure you write things down. You know things down. Draw things down. Because today's generation, you know, there's a lot of fight for your attention fight for your things you know you go on social media people are all over the place so write some few things down uh, that will be a blessing to you is that okay john chapter 9 very familiar scripture we are going to i'm going to not going to talk for too long by six o'clock i'll finish so that you can go home john chapter 9 john chapter 9 we are reading the first seven verses john chapter 9 John is in the Bible. John 7, 9, verse 1 to 7. And I think it might be on the screen. Okay. All right. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but, the, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he has said these things, now note this carefully because that is where we're going to dwell a little. When he has said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and he said, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. He went and washed and he came back seeing for a few minutes i want to ask to discuss what i entitled the power of the place somebody say the place say it like you mean it. say i like i like interaction say the place say i belong to a place i don't belong everywhere but i belong somewhere or say it like your mouth belongs to you i hope you didn't rent your mouth say my mouth belongs to me so I'll say it like my mouth is mine. Say, I don't belong everywhere. I belong to a place. And my place is this place. You know, this, this, this narrative that we have just read, for me, for somebody today, it could be one of the most eye-opening passages that you can ever see. You know, we can take the stories in the Bible and go every direction or whatever direction you want to go, but... My direction that I want to go is going to make sense to you in a very few minutes. The reason is that living faith here, you are a young church. A whole lot of people are coming in. A whole lot of people will come and go. People will come and spy. A whole lot of things. But I want to draw your mind to something very important that once you understand, you will never take the place that God sends you to for granted. You will never take the place that God sends you to for granted. And this truth that I'm talking about one time was forcefully illustrated to me. I had a bottle of water. And Doc knows that where, where I am in Atlanta, 
it's almost like here, very, very hot. Sometimes it can be hot. And uh, a bottle of water, and you sit, sit in a plane, go to somewhere like maybe New York or Chicago, which is very cold. I left a bottle of water in a car somewhere very cold. And after I did everything that I had gone to do and I went back to the car, the bottle of water had become ice. Now, it dawned on me, dog, that the water and the bottle is the same. But in one place, it was liquid. I took it to another place and it sat for a little while and it became ice. So what happened? The environment that the bottle of water found itself in determined whether it was liquid or it became ice. Am I making sense? Same water, same bottle, same owner. But one environment made sure that it remained liquid and another environment made sure that it became ice. And this enforced my belief in that the place where you are planted, the place where you find yourself, the place that you spend a lot of time matters in your life. And I pray that after this teaching, somebody will make up your mind that there are some places you will not go there again. There are some areas that you will not hang around again because wherever you spend the majority of your time will change you. Sometimes I've heard people say, oh, I can't go to that church because it is rich people's church. I can't go to that church is because of people like this church. Listen, everywhere that you find yourself will have an effect on you. Oh, you didn't hear me at all. I said everywhere that you find yourself will have an effect on you. It's very, very, very important. Because where you are located, where you are located is very, very, very important. All through scriptures, we see it. That is why when you look at Genesis, when God was creating, he made sure that he would create an environment first before he places something in there. Now look at Genesis chapter 1. You realize that God did not create birds before he created the skies. He makes the skies, then he creates birds. God did not make fish before he made water. God made water before fish. Because if God created the fish first, where was the environment the fish was going to survive in? So God will create an environment and he will put you in there. In fact, he spent five days creating an environment and after he had finished the five days of environment, he introduced Adam and Eve into that environment. Which means environment matters. Wherever you find yourself is very, 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 very important. Your welfare, your well-being is not just in who you are but it also impacted by where you are. You, who you are is important. But where you are is very, very, very important. And please listen. Everything that matters to God also matters to the devil, but in a negative way. Your environment, your location matters to God. That is why it's very important. I'm getting you somewhere. And the enemy also knows it. That is why one of the assignments of the adversary, of the enemy, is to always try to get you out of the place where God has planted you. I hope you're understanding me this morning. Am I making sense? Am I making sense? See, one of the ways that the devil tries to disrupt your life, to destroy your life, to take you on a detour, is to get you out of your proper environment because you will thrive in the right environment you will thrive in the right environment doc will tell you I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know that america is very big and if you take an orange seed to florida south of where i live and you plant it chances are that you are going to get very good oranges and get your orange fruit and orange juice if you take the same seed and you travel way up to somewhere like Wisconsin and you plant the orange. It's the same seed, but because of the difference in environment, the one that you planted up north is not going to thrive. In fact, it may die because it is very, very, very cold. It's the same thing that we find ourselves. In fact, one of the stories that you may know is the story of the prodigal son. You remember? How many of you heard the story of the prodigal son? The so-called prodigal son. 
And you know, that is in Luke chapter 15, when you read from verse number 11, it talks about that. And it talks about two sons. The Bible says that the younger, the younger son, and for me, anytime it says the younger son, I think about immaturity. Immaturity. And please don't get me wrong because many times immaturity has not got to do with age. You can be young only once, but you can be immature indefinitely. I've seen people who are quite old in age and yet they are very immature. You are not able to handle your emotions well. You are not able to relate very well. You are not able to do anything well. But on this, I'm, I'm thinking about a man who came to his father, a young son, and he was taken out of a very good environment. He knew there were, there, were, there, were, there were three things. Number one, arrogance got him out of his father's house. He came to the father and he said, I've got to leave. And sometimes out of arrogance, we feel that staying in one church, staying in one place, staying under covering, stay, is too restrictive. There are people who think, ah, so me, I can't be seated in one church. I attend every church. And so they have become like spiritual mosquitoes. They go everywhere to eat. Then they come home to give us malaria. They're all over the place. He also felt that he was entitled. He came to his father and said, give me what is mine. Give me what is mine. Please let me talk to somebody today. One of the things that can steal your blessing, one of the things that can make you unhappy, one of the things that will not let people help you is a sense of entitlement. And especially in our Ghanaian community, there are a lot of very good things about us as Ghanaians, but there are also some very interesting things about us Ghanaians. And one of them is a sense of entitlement. Please listen to me. Let me give you, a, I hardly talk about myself. 99% of the time, I'm not interested in that. But let me share something to you. Every day of my life, when I wake up, after whatever my meditation, my prayer, whatever, before I step out, I have a meeting with myself. Before I step out of my bedroom, I talk to myself. And I say, Franco, Sophia, let's have a meeting. On this Sunday, don't forget this. Nobody owes you anything. That is how I feel in life. I walk through life and I say that nobody owes me anything. If somebody blesses me, fine. If somebody doesn't bless me, I am okay. Because I am not entitled to anything. So I don't walk through life with my hands like this, looking for what somebody will give to me. The reason why some of you are offended with God, you are offended with people, you are angry with uncles and husbands who may be struggling more than you, but Facebook wouldn't tell, is because you have this sense of entitlement. Your money belongs to me. Your house belongs to me. Your things belong to me. So if you don't give to me, then I am angry. And that is the fabric of our nation. We feel that we are entitled to things. Please walk through life with this understanding that nobody owes me anything. I need to get up myself. I need to do something. If God uses people to bless me, praise the Lord. If people don't bless me, praise the Lord, at the end of the day, the same God that blessed them can be the same God that blesses me. Don't wake up in the morning, go on your Facebook page to see how many, of you, how many people liked you. How many likes did I get? Who ever told you that the people who are liking you really like you? They are only monitoring spirits. I don't like the way you look at me. I don't like that. And, and the guy also, I believe, he had arrogance. He came to the father and said, I can't wait for you to die. Just give me whatever I want now. And so he left his father's house. And one of the things that surprised me in the story, and I'm going to ask it with a question. When the boy left home, evangelist, Father gave him whatever he wanted, but he, father didn't say anything. It was later when he came back that father was talking to the senior brother. Father said, this your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost by his father, which means the day he was leaving home, father knew the guy was going to die, but he didn't say anything. I have a question for you. What is it that is in your father's head that he knows about you that he hasn't said anything? What is in your pastor's head that he knows about you that he hasn't said anything yet? Sometimes the saddest thing that can happen to you 
is to be in a church where your pastor cannot say anything to you. Because if nobody can teach you anything, your only teacher will be pain. I don't think you really understand. Let me go and try it here. I don't like the way they are looking at me here. I said, if nobody can teach you, your only teacher will be pain. This one too is boring. Let me see. <laughs> I said, the only one, I, I hope you understand me. I hope I'm not talking too fast. I hope I'm not talking Greek. Okay? Now, please hear me. Whatever happened to that prodigal son is what is happening to many people in the local church all over the world. Especially when this coronavirus came, this pandemic came. It began to show the heart of many people. I tell a lot of people based on a quotation that I read many years ago that this pandemic truly didn't come to destroy us. It came to expose us. It came to expose a lot of people. It showed what was in our hearts. Whether we will serve God when the, when the going is tough, whether we serve him, whether we understand or not. Because one time a host of people followed Jesus in the wilderness for many days. He was doing miracles for them. Until he really began to preach. The Bible says they all left. Thousands of people and he was left with just a few. And Jesus asked the disciples, will you also go away? And Peter said, where else have we got to go? We have walked you. We have observed you. We have walked with you. We have realized and I've come to that conclusion. That you are the only one who has the words of life. So I'm not following you because of bread. I'm not following you because of miracles. But I am following you because you are the one that teaches us the true way. What is your motivation for following the Lord? Can you come to that place where you can say that to this God I live and to this God I die. To this God, whether I have it or whether I don't have it, I will still follow him regardless. For me, that is the essence of of commitment but i realize that all over the world today people are just being taken out of the house of god of the place that god has planted them in fact you listen to social media people are even letting us understand that the church is irrelevant you can sit home and please don't get me wrong those online and um, i'm addressing those um, those online it's not for those who live just three minutes down the road i'm talking about maybe our friends and family in new york and all over the place who are far away or those who follow the bishop's ministry. But listen to me. Your local church has no substitute. But the enemy will try to drag you out of the place. So that you not thrive like you used to. And in this scripture that we read. Jesus is, is on assignment. And they see this man. The Bible says he was born blind. And I suspect that the disciples were charismatics. Because the first question is, who sinned? Sometimes we can be so insensitive in the house of God. We don't take our time to understand why people are going through what they are going through. And so we make assumptions about people. Please listen to me. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. When you come to church, forget about the weave, forget about the extended eyelashes and all those things. You never know what people are going through in this life. I made a statement on Friday night to your bishop, your pastor, your bishop. And he said, wow, that's a powerful thing. I said, bishop, I don't know about you, but for me, an individual is more important than a crowd. An individual is more important than a crowd. So listen, especially those of you who are leaders, walk slowly through the crowd. And take your time to understand. Because sometimes people are crying, but our ears are not trained to listen to the cries of people. Sometimes we can be so insensitive. Listen, when we come to church and there's a woman who is dancing when there's no music, before you look down on the woman and say, ah, oh, no, so I Listen, you don't understand. Maybe behind the, behind the dance, there, there, there's, a, there's a story that you have no idea about. 
when somebody is seated in church and they are saying preach it when the preacher hasn't even preached before you say no so I don't listen there is a story that you don't understand you don't know what they fought to get to church you don't know that maybe they have been wearing the same dress for three months you come to church and look at what shoe are they wearing what wig are they wearing you don't know people's story ladies and gentlemen you cannot understand where I'm coming from unless you have walked in the shoes that I am walking in it is time for the church to be sensitive it is time for us to take our time to listen to the voice of people that are going through things this is the house of God and this is a place where we must take our time to understand humanity ladies and gentlemen human beings are suffering human beings are weak human beings are crying but it's the church listening to tell you the truth people's dressing on Sunday mornings they don't impress me because the church is the only hospital listen to this the church is the only hospital that sick people go to pretend they are well it's the only hospital we are listen all of us are patients so we are you know, you're correct we all come to pretend there are some, some people you can see them even a blind person can see that and call you and you ask them how are you i'm all right how everybody's an amorite. How are you? I'm alright. How are you? I'm alright. We are all amorites. But people are going through things. You see, people must come to the church and understand that regardless of where I'm coming from, regardless of what I have done, regardless of my life, Jesus accepts me and my heart is looking for something and God will meet me. Say, who, who was born blind? And Jesus said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And Jesus begins to interact with the man. And listen. Look at how Jesus changes the man's life. This is, in a few minutes I'll sit down, but listen. Are, are you getting me? I'm taking you somewhere. Because Jesus does something that he has never done before. I went through the Gospels and I checked, has he ever done this thing before? And I realized, evangelist, that he had never done that before. The man comes to Jesus and the Bible says that Jesus spits on the ground. Mixes the mud with the saliva and smears, smears it on the man's eyes. And I'm wondering, why would Jesus do such a thing? Why would Jesus do such a thing? And I kept thinking, and I kept thinking, and I kept thinking, I said, Here is a man that somebody is sick many miles away. And he just tells the man, Go, your servant is healed. Speak the word only, and it happens. Here is a man that speaks to trees and the trees die. He meets a funeral procession. He touches the thing and the boy gets up. And now he is spitting. Jesus could have said, be healed. And many times he says that. But why is he spitting on the ground? And if it were to be today, oh Lord, social media will be buzzing. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, IG, TikTok, the preacher who spits. Headlines, hashtag spitting preacher. You don't know what I'm talking about. Then, I, 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 why would Jesus do this? Then I began to think that maybe there's a significance here. Whenever they want to test for paternity to see who your father is, there are several things that they can use, but I think one of the things that maybe they used or they still do is your saliva. Maybe, Doc, I hope I'm right. They use your saliva to get DNA from you. They pick things from your mouth. So I thought about it and I said, maybe when God created us, remember in Genesis that he used the dust of the ground to create us. And so if he puts his spit DNA on dust, then he's telling us that once upon a time, you and I were dirty out of the dust we're sinners we're sinful but he took us as we are and he put his dna on you and i and told the whole world that i am your father oh am i talking to somebody i am your father so please hear me it doesn't matter your background it doesn't matter where you are coming from it doesn't matter what you may have done in life if anyone be in christ that person becomes a brand new creature all 
all things have passed away and behold everything has become new don't let anybody look down on you don't let anybody talk down on you don't let anybody refer you to your past where you are coming from because you cannot help where you are coming from but you can help where God is taking you you may have been terrible, you may have been down but I'm here to announce to you that God Almighty called you to himself he loves you just as you are it is what, what you do that makes him love you but it is who you are have you realized ladies and gentlemen that many times in the church we validate ourselves by the things that we do but let me make an announcement you go in the eyes of God it's not what you do that makes you anything it's who you are because when Jesus Christ was baptized Luke chapter 3 verse 21 in the Jordan and he came out of the Jordan at the age of 30 the Bible says that the heavens were open the Holy Spirit like a dove came upon him hear me the Bible says that and the father said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased now my question is up to that time had Jesus worked the miracle no had he raised the dead no had he preached no and yet the father said I still love him so I realized that father loves me not because of my miracles not because of my preaching but because of who he has made me so listen from today walk with a smile on your face sing blessed assurance Jesus is mine don't let anybody put you down not because you have money or you don't have money but it's because who he has made you you may not be the most handsome in your family you may not be the most beautiful in your family and yet he bypassed everybody and he said come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest so every day when you lift up your voice to God thank him for the gift of salvation thank him that he got you born again thank him that if you were the only person who was ever created on earth he will still send his son Jesus Christ to die for you when he was creating he only spoke but when he was liberating you he had to bleed that is how important you are Jesus, he puts the mud on the man's eyes. And this is where it gets interesting. Jesus gives him a specific instruction. He says, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Instructions are very important. Sometimes what stands between you and your breakthrough is obedience to a ridiculous instruction. If you are willing to do the ridiculous, God will be willing to do the miraculous. You didn't hear me at all. I said, if you are willing to do the ridiculous, God will be willing to do the miraculous for you. Sometimes the price you have to pay for a breakthrough is to allow God to embarrass you. Do something that is embarrassing. Go and wash. Now, if it were me, trust me, I'll ask Jesus. I can't see. I come to you. You have put dust. I've had a lot of testimonies. You speak and people get healed. You do this. But why me now? You are putting your saliva on me. Why? And now you are sending me to go and wash. How do I even go there? Then I thought about the whole thing again. And I said, well, Jesus did his part. He put his DNA on the man. Saved you and I. But there's a part for you and I. He said, go to a specific... Jesus said, you know, there, there are many pools. There were many rivers. There were many lakes. There were many pools. But he sent the man to a particular one. He said, go to the pool of Silwa. And once you wash, your eye problem will go away. Your eyes will be open. So I believe that it is only God who can get you and I born again. He can regenerate and change our hearts. But after that, God sends us to a place where our eyes are open and we begin to see things. One of the things I realized that when you are blind, you are restricted, you are limited. Your movement is limited. Your progress is limited. Your dynamism is limited. Things are limited. It's hard to move very fast in life when you can't see. So Jesus sends the man to Siloam. And interestingly, look at it. Look, 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 at, look at the thing. Is, is there, he said, yes. He said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which, by inter which is by interpretation sent. So Jesus sent the man to a place called Sent. I'm sending you to Sent.
which means there's a particular place. So the question is, wherever you are today, did he send you here? If he did, then this is your pool of silver. You are born again. But that is why you are going to have your eyes washed so that you can begin to see very well. I want to submit today before I sit down that your pool of, your, your pool of Siloam is your local church. It's your local church. You can be born again everywhere, anywhere. Some of you are born again out of a crusade. Some of you are born again online. Some of you are born again when somebody witnessed to you. Some of you are born again because you are desperate and you called out for Jesus Christ. But he has to send you to a particular place where your eyes will be washed. The pool, the local church, is a place that Jesus wants to help all of us to see in ways that we have never seen before and to move in ways that we have never moved before. I thank God for this house. I thank God. I walked in here and I said, oh, this just looks like Mount Vernon in New York, in, in New, York, New York State. Some of you are going to have your eyes opened in some dimensions that will surprise you. I don't know about you, but before I got born again, I want to consider myself that I was not a person who wasn't smart at books, that is. But in life, I realized that I was very stupid. I made very bad decisions. When the devil told me to sin one, I was sin two to the glory of his name. I smoked everything from grass to bamboo. I smoked it. I drank enough to float a ship. The night I got born again on a Wednesday night, in those days in Koforidua where I got born again, our home was quite far away from the main town. The next morning after I got born again was the first time, Doc, that I heard birds singing. I began to see the beauty of God's creation. And I asked myself, where have I been all this time? I was walking through life, but my eyes were blind. Paul said that the God of this world has blinded, and that is why, please forgive me tonight, today, as I come direct on your case. Haven't you realized that once you got born again, suddenly it dawned on you? Why did I sleep with that person? Why did I allow that person to sleep with me? Why did I go to the places I used to go? Why did I spend the money that I used to spend? You used to do that until your eyes were opened in the pool of Siloam. If you don't learn, if you don't get your eyes open here, your eyes will never open anywhere. A woman one time came to me in Atlanta. She... She had gotten married to a man and she was relocating. And she said to me, Pastor, there's only one thing. She said, I can spend all day thanking you and mommy, but there's one thing I want to say. And I said, tell me. She said, I want to say thank you that if for nothing at all, you taught me how to save money for my future. And I said, I would like to listen to that. She said, I used to work for Coca-Cola company. I was a top executive. But Papa, I had never saved one dollar in my life. When I go to the store to shop, I will shop like there's no tomorrow. I will buy shoes that an octopus may not even need. I just bought everything. I just wasted money. Until I came to this house, I got born again and I sat down and I began to listen to you. Looks like something had been taken off my eyes. He said, Papa, if I told you how much money I have saved and the investments I'm about to make, you will clap for me. And I said, take that testimony and tell other people that there's always a place that when you go to, your eyes open. Please listen. Coming to church, coming to this house, coming to your pool of silver, it's not only a matter of dressing up on a Sunday for people to look at what you wore. Coming to clap and shout and dance. No, but it's to come to have your eyes open to the reality of life. Listen. Jesus, Jesus did not only come to, to die for us to go to heaven. For me, that is the ultimate. But he also came to teach you and I how to make good decisions in life. Good decisions in life. Never forget that. Adam made a bad decision in the garden. He made a good decision on the Mount of Temptation. And he's teaching you and I to make good decisions. How many of you are learning something today? 
How many of you are learning? Listen, church. This is a young church. This is a growing church. One of the things that I'm going to ask is that you must learn to protect this pool. Protect this house. Because this is a place that people will come and have their eyes open. Make sure that nobody contaminates this pool. Make sure that nobody puts down this pool. Make sure that nobody so destroys the pool that other people cannot come and drink. In Ezekiel chapter 37, when you read verse 14 to 17, there's an indictment there that any time I read it, I get sad. Ezekiel chapter 34, if you can put it there for me, if not, we, we, we'll get right on. But it is so sad. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34, verse, verse 17. 17. Give me verse number 17. Ezekiel 34, 17. He said, as for you, O my flock, this is what the Lord is saying. He said, I will judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the goats. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. He said, does this seem a small thing to you? Please listen. There was pain in the heart of the prophet as he spoke on behalf of the spirit. That after you have eaten the good grass, you tread it down with your feet. The residue of your past. The truth is, he said that when you have drunk the waters, you foul the residue with your feet. He said that there are people in church like that. You come to church and you eat the good food of the word. You come to church, you drink the living waters. But when you finish, you destroy the grass and you destroy the water for those who are coming after you. That is what the Lord is saying to us. Listen, when this house has been a blessing to you and this house is not going to be perfect, there's no, listen, there's no perfect church. And the day you find the perfect church, you'll be the first one to spoil it. Evangelists, when I read in the book of Revelation that and there was war in heaven, I said to myself, dog, if there's war in heaven, why can't there be war in the church? We would disagree. Somebody will say something you don't like. Somebody's going to put on a color of lipstick you can't stand. Somebody's perfume will put you off. Somebody's wig will not be straight. <laughs> but at the end of the day, this is a hospital for all of us. Somebody's straightening her weave, that's fine, it's okay. <laughs> but listen, we must protect this house. How many of you know we must protect this house? Don't allow anybody to talk down on your pool of Siloam. Especially the place that has blessed you. And then, the second thing then I'm done is that understand that there are benefits in the pool. There are benefits in the house of God. Because everywhere you go, there are some markers that identify where you can go to receive some particular help. For example, if you are hungry and you want some food to eat, you are going to look for a sign that says restaurant. Yes? Papaya, uh, KFC or whatever, Star Bites, all those things that you guys go, that is what you do. If you are sick and you need to see a doctor, you are not going, let's say you are going to look for Dr. Champo, you are not going to look for him at Macola Market. You are going to go to his clinic. You are going to go to a hospital. That is how it is. When, when, whenever you need something, there's a particular place you go to. You agree with me? I said, do you agree with me? I said, do you agree with me? And the truth of the matter, even when you are sick, the hospital doesn't heal you. It is who and what is in the hospital that heals you. Which means you can go to a particular church and there's nothing there to help you. So it's who is there and what is there. And so it's very, very important that you find your seal worm. And there are three things, three benefits. Let me give it to you in three minutes and I'll sit down. Number one, in your pool of seal worm, in the house of God, number one, there's protection. Somebody say protection. Oh, say like you mean it. Please give me Proverbs chapter 27 verse 8. Proverbs 27 verse 8. There's protection in the house of God. And please let me tell you something. This world is a dangerous place. It is a danger. The Bible says that as a bird wanders from her nest, so is the person that wanders from their place. When, when birds, when they build their nest, their nest is for safety. The nest is for protection. Whenever the birds leave their nest, they can become a target 
for predators. I hope to God Almighty that there's nobody here like that, but I'm addressing people, not you, but those online. I'm addressing somebody listening to me. Many of you are never at the place where God has planted you. And you wonder why you are always under attack. You are never where God has planted you. Let me tell you something. The protection and the blessing and the lifting of God is location specific. God will bless you at what God says, I want to bless you here. And you decide to stand here. He's not going to send it to you by post office. You've got to be where the blessing is. You've got to understand that. I have, I've, been, I've, been, I've been doing this God's way for about 41 years. I've seen a few things. People that were planted in the house of God, they were doing very good until somebody lured them and they left their nest. I've seen marriages fall apart which they shouldn't have. I've seen people's children become wayward, vagabonds, rude, bad, terrible because they took them out of a place where they were living in nature. I was so glad when I saw these young girls and I said to myself, this is what will keep these young girls here. So that nobody will go and influence them out there. So if you, like Dr. Champon said, if you have your children, please pay a little price and bring them for rehearsal. Pay a little price and let them do something in the house of God. Because you are investing for their protection in the future. There are people who are teaching our children online. There are influencers influencing our children online. And ladies and gentlemen, it is time that the church must protect our own. Some of you are coming from some families that there are lines that have been drawn that nobody crosses. Some of you are coming from families that no woman marries, no man marries. But I'm here to submit that if you are here, the protection of the Lord is upon you. No Goliath will take you down. Everything that has been speaking against your family, in the name of the Lord, you will rise up and silence that Goliath. When David was facing Goliath, he took five stones, but he didn't need four of them. He only took the first stone to bring down Goliath. Let me submit that you will be the first stone in your family. You silence poverty. You silence early death. You silence everything that the enemy is bringing. If you believe that, say amen. And number two, there's productivity. Not only is there protection, but in the house of God, you become productive. Psalm 92 verse 13 says that those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. A lot of people don't flourish because they are not planted. They are not planted. You must stay long enough you know, this past Friday, we, we traveled, my wife and I, we traveled, and there's a particular plant that she really likes. It's a, it's a herb, whatever. So we saw one in my sister's house, and mommy said, oh, I want to plant one of them in our home in Accra. So they got a couple of them for us. They uprooted them from her garden, and we came and planted them. Yesterday, I went to look at the thing, and everyone was like this. And I said to myself, what happened? They were like that. Yesterday, in another location, when I uprooted them and I brought them to a new environment, they were one like this. Then I thought about it that many Christians are like that. If every day you are being uprooted and transplanted, uprooted and transplanted, how do you flourish? You must learn to sit at one place. Muchi in dodo. Obiad in and you wonder why you are the way you are. Everywhere you are there, osophobia we would be. I'm trying to speak to you because of the way you are looking at me. Muchi muchi in dodo. What are spiritual mosquitoes? Be bia money now. No more be fear be my malaria. Tell somebody sit down. Oh, please say it. Are you afraid of him? Tell him, I say, sit down. Listen, planted. When God came in the garden, he asked Adam, Adam, where are you? A God who knows everything is asking somebody who knows nothing, where are you? It wasn't because God didn't know where Adam was. But he was saying, Adam, I planted you at a place. Why have you listened to somebody else? And you have moved out of your place. And you have lost your productivity. Listen to me. Anybody who has your ear has your future. You didn't hear me. I want to try it here. 
I said, anybody who is informing you is forming you. Who are you listening to? Who is teaching you? Who is leading you? So, whenever in your house there's protection, there's productivity, and lastly, there's instruction. It's instruction. God is everywhere. But there are some places that God will send you to go and listen to specific instructions for your life. Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 1 says that and the Lord's the word of the Lord came to me, that is Jeremiah, that go to the porter's house and I'll show you some things. I'll give you some instructions there. Listen to me. Every day we have church. So long as you are able, with no excuse, come to the, work, to the house of God. Get instructions. Get leadership. Let me finish. I'm done. I know that there are many hundreds and thousands of people in this neighborhood, outside of this neighborhood, who are blind. Jesus is getting ready to send them to their place, this place. Please, when people come to church, please, I know it's a young church, and sometimes even in old churches, we do that. When people come to church, please listen. Don't judge them. Don't judge people. Am I making sense? I said, don't judge people. It's a process. It's a process. One of the pastors that I have a very good relationship with. We all grew up together in the same church dock. And when he got born again, I was already an associate pastor in our church here in Ghana. And this guy used to struggle in some areas and he got born again. And one day he he permanently borrowed somebody's shoes. In a Shalibuche English, he stole the shoes. And it became a big scandal. And they brought the guy to church board. And before they brought him in, he sat outside. And we sat in the meeting and they were deliberating about the young man. And some were saying we should discipline him. Some said throw him out of the church. He's disgracing the church. And I was an associate pastor. I was just about 24, 25 years old. So very, yeah, very quiet. I sat and I was listening. They went on and on and on and on and on. And then somebody, I think my pastor said, Pastor, what do you think? And my first question was, how long has this gentleman been in the church? A few months. And I said, so how many of you have taken time to go to him? To encourage him or even to ask what happened. But because it was says, and I said, You mean this building or the denomination is more important than this guy? So my pastor said to the meeting that whatever Pastor Frank says, we will follow. So what do you say? And I said, I this is what I say: that we should call the man and tell him to go and do that no more. <laughs> oh, come and see. People were angry. There was this one woman. He says, I stood up and I went outside and I said to the guy, When you come in, whatever question they ask you, don't answer. All you have to say is, I am very sorry. Please help me to become a better human being. This is a testimony. Me, my testimonies are not money testimonies, they are human being testimonies. And I brought a guy. You could see that he was broken. And they were asking him all kinds of questions. And all he kept saying was, So I said, Young man, go free. Just go. Don't go and do that again. Ah. People were angry. There's this woman who stood up. Then this woman stormed out. She was angry. Now, I'm telling you two things that happened. Exactly one week later, exactly one week later, that woman was hard. It was found out that her daughter was pregnant when she was not married. And I said, Yem free meeting, Yem free meeting, Yem free meeting, Yem free meeting, Yem free meeting. I'm not going to say I did anything. 